Want to say hello and wish everybody a good Monday morning. I'm here with a good friend of mine, James Kelly, a fellow activist and member of the Americans for Legal Reform. You're good right. morning. <laughs> yeah, good morning. So we just want to get started here. You know, when I uh, call James, we, there's a, so many things that James and I do as far as court watching and, and activism that I was literally like, well, okay, well, what do you want to talk about today, Jim? <laughs> and, uh, you know, he has actually something to key point, things that I bring up is basically... Uh, cameras in court and court watching so we have quite a bit that we want to talk about this morning so while i'm getting set up james why don't you kind of give a little intro and uh what you've been up to with court cameras in court okay well uh, i've got a variety of different things going on but i i want to start by discussing why it's important to have cameras in court and it is absolutely critical because power corrupts absolute power corrupts absolutely now uh many of you may be aware that we have the right to record our executive uh, public officers, uh, police, uh, in public, subject to reasonable time, place, and manner. That comes from two, uh, two different cases. One is Glick v. Kniff, 2011, in the First Circuit. The, uh, the other is Alvarez v. Illinois, 2012, in the uh, Seventh Circuit, I believe, or Sixth Circuit, I'm not sure. But uh, what those two cases have established is that we have the clearly established right to record public officials in public subject to reasonable time, place, and manner. Now, the courtroom is a public place. The judge is a public official. But in New York State, we have uh, rules posted all over saying that you cannot record in the court. And even uh, judges have even more power, more authority than police. So inherently, there is more ability for more corruption. And to be honest, if, uh, if you had considered myself and Carlos back 15 years ago, uh, it, it would be interesting if we sat down with ourselves now and, and had that conversation that this is what life is like. I think we'd start out with, there's no way. Exactly. <laughs> no that way. is exactly what we would do. Yeah. There was, we would not believe it. I mean, yeah. I make a distinction between them and us. There are two types of people. There are them who believe that the courts are fundamentally fair, impartial, that they basically work, and that sometimes things go wrong. And that's who we were. That's where yeah. we came from. But who we are now is us. We know better. Well, I think one, I, I repeat myself a lot because one of the things I always say is that, you know, I, I believed in the this, this system with the faith of a child and I really believe it's going to be just. So even though it seemed like everything was going wrong, I was like, well, the courts are just. I'm providing all the documentation. I should be okay. And the big thing is my naivete. Uh, is what led to my demise. So really one of the things that Jim and I hope to do is to reach people before you become so deep, you know, become a, a victim that there's nothing, you know, there's nothing you can do about it. Jim and I are essentially in a legal hospice right now. <laughs> I look at it as hospice. Jim is fighting back pretty good, though, so I'll give you credit yeah. for that. I, uh, I, I've decided that I don't want to fight with my ex. I'd rather fight with the judiciary. The whole judiciary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's uh, that's what I'm doing. I mean, if you think about understanding what we learned in school and look at it from the perspective now, we like to think that we have rights. We like to think that one of those rights yeah. is due process of law. We like to think that the rule of law supersedes the rule of man. But the reality is that that was founded uh, June 15th of the year 1215 in Runnymede, uh, Great Britain, where 25 barons at knife point held the king and made the king sign the Magna Carta. Now, that needed to be done under threat of death. And, and the king was held there for a few days, and, and eventually the Magna Carta was signed. Uh, chapter 39 or clause 39 depending on how you look at it was the right to due process so for 805 years we've had that right but unless we actually go in and aggressively enforce that ourselves we don't have that right mm. we don't have any rights unless we know we have them unless we know how to enforce them and unless we vigorously enforce them ourselves we have nothing and Thomas Valve is a great example of that Thomas Valva did not get due process of law. 
he you may want to fill it on, on the valve case just a little bit so people follow I know many people do know about the valve case but there may be some of you out there less familiar with it Thomas Valvo was an eight-year-old child and uh, he was uh, he was denied by the courts a relationship with his mother and he was put into the sole custody of his father who was abusive and under whose care uh, custody and control he suffered an untimely death by freezing to death in the garage so what we have is a situation where Thomas as a child forget about any adults forget about me forget about my ex forget about Carlos forget about his ex child children uh, they're stripped of the right to an equal relationship with their parents that is done across the board that is wrong uh, they uh, they're stripped of any assets of, of any relationships uh, of any rights and they are basically um, prisoners and they need to respond to that environment and there's nothing right about that but they don't have the ability to go and vigorously enforce their rights themselves and a lot of times in just about every case their parents do not understand their own rights never mind the rights of their ch children so by having cameras in court one of the things that I hope to achieve is, is to be able to wake people up to some of the major systemic injustices that go on and of course the court does not want this to happen the court wants to stop this in every which way and uh, there, there's nothing the court fears more than a, a person that understands the law that does not have a bar license and, and is not admitted to the bar uh, that knows procedurally how to enforce their rights and uh, that actually does it well, the, the key point with that is that uh, if you d if you are part of the bar, uh, they would have influence over you because you, you'd be afraid of your career being in peril. Uh, not being a bar member and being aware of what you do know does make you a threat because now they can't hold that over your head. So exactly. that's that's a good, that's a really really big point that people really need to know is that you know when you go in and attorneys claims that they're going to fight for you. Uh, and they're gonna, you know, um, they're gonna fight for your rights, and they know the judge, and they know this, that, and the other thing. In the end, they have to work with that judge again. So the promises of a vigorous fight and a robust fight for your rights is uh, is basically a sales pitch. It's 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 a false false statement. This is unfortunately true. Uh, there was actually a move back uh, in the early 1800s to eliminate attorneys from the courtroom. Uh, I do believe attorneys have the a place in the courtroom uh, I, I do believe that attorneys would would do very well to help educate their clients and to sit as second chair uh, I think that's a, a very useful position because many uh, litigants that have not trained formally in in law are are at a significant disadvantage so there there's the statement those who have themselves for an attorney have a fool for an attorney and to some degree that is a correct statement but those people who take the time to actually read the law to learn the law to learn the procedures it becomes a different situation and I'm going to give you well they, they count on you being naive absolutely That's what that statements all about so they, they, they don't have you know they know that you're not going to be educated in the way to play their game and uh, you know, I, I make the analogy to uh, medicine. Like a lot of times, people say, "I know I'm not supposed to read WebMD or whatever," and I always welcome people to do that. It's like, no, I want you to read that, and I want you to look because if if it's a challenge to me, it's something I could learn from and help the next person. So I always encourage people read about it. You may come up with something I'm not familiar with. You may come up with a treatment option I'm not aware of. It doesn't work that way legally. You're not encouraged to research on your own and to do stuff because they want to tell you how to do it and play the game in a way that, you know, they know the outcome. You know, yep. if, if you're not versed, you don't know the outcome and you fall victim. Now, I'm going to give you an example that Carlos was actually present for. And uh, it, it's, it's interesting because we did court watching last week uh, in the Central Islip Courthouse uh, Family Court. And it was for a defendant who was under the threat of incarceration. Uh, he had been recently incarcerated. Uh, in, in that appearance before, uh, uh, before the judge, 
his significant other was prevented from physically being in the courtroom. It was him, it was his attorney, and that was it. And he ended up getting incarcerated uh, because of that. Now, um, family members uh, came up with some of the, the purge for, for getting him out uh, that was applied towards bail, but uh, he was to come up with the balance. And we were, uh, we were going in last week to, uh, to witness uh, what would happen because he did not have the full balance. So there was still the active threat of incarceration. Uh, and the, again, the, the previous week, the, the, uh, uh, the gentleman's significant others uh, was not allowed into the courtroom at all. She was told no. So when we got there, we tried to enter through the wrong door. We were told, no, you can't get into the building this way. You've got to go in through the other door. Fine. We attempt, and there are four of us. Remember what he said? They, they, they feared cross-contamination. That's why we weren't allowed from one building that was connected to the building we needed to be into. And I, I just had to shake my head and laugh. Now, like you're letting us into the building. Where's the cross-contamination? Bear in mind, yeah. Carlos is a doctor. <laughs> yeah, I just, I just had to shake my head. So um, the four of us go over to the other, uh, the other door. We go to try and enter into the other door, and we are stopped before we even make entry into the lobby. And we are told it is litigants only. And if you're not a litigant, you can't come in here. So that is what they wanted us to perceive. That is what they wanted us to believe. That's what they were told to put out there. Uh, and of course, it, it's done with an intent to intimidate because the person saying this is a uniformed officer with a badge, with handcuffs, with a gun, with a clipboard. Uh, and that comes to the door in a very authoritative manner to, to try and prevent any people from coming in that, that don't have business being there. And um, so he was attempting to only let the defendant in. And that wasn't working for me. So I kind of opened my mouth at that point. That was good. And I said, in that case, I'd like to make an emergency oral application before the judge. That's not what they're accustomed to. And I have at this point a bit of a reputation over there I think mm -hmm. yeah, I think I know, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I have to give you credit though because he was giving I think he was giving the company line but he mm -hmm. was receptive and I have to say he did treat us with respect absolutely he was trying to play the game the way they told him to play but I have to give him credit because you know I, w I thought he would be more belligerent like the first court officer we ran into that wouldn't let us into the building because we went to the wrong door so I, I after what I did in at the end of April, I don't think that's going to happen again. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'll I'll take a quick departure and and tell you what happened in uh, at the end of April. Um, first, I had COVID back in March and I recovered and I quarantined and decided I needed to file papers in uh, in that same building, uh, Supreme Court side, and uh, that I was not going to wear a mask because. Uh, the executive order 202.17 was unconstitutional and it was in direct conflict with a another statute that was found valid and constitutional that being new york state penal code section 240.35 sub 4 that says you cannot wear a mask in public so i walk into the court i'm the only person there and and i did it without court watchers which is unusual of me but i'm the only person there and uh, there's about six people in uniforms, nobody else in the building. And uh, they, uh, they jump all over me. They say, you can't be in here without a mask. You got to wear the mask. It's the executive order and all of that. Okay. And I look at them and I say, you don't have the authority to require me to violate New York State Penal Code Section 240.35 sub 4. Huh? <laughs> you got to wear a mask. <laughs> so I negotiated. I put on a mask. And uh, I, I went to see the clerk. And I needed to come back in two weeks to get my business completed. And I wasn't happy. I, I was in a bit of a mood at that point. <laughs> they don't want to get me in a mood again. <laughs> it's just not a good thing. And I'll explain why. Um, I, I went home and I wrote a letter of complaint. Now, understand, that particular officer... Um, 
he was respectful. He was doing the right thing. I had nothing but complimentary things to say, with the exception of him not knowing Penal Code uh, 240.35 sub 4 and trying to enforce. So that that was the only little little thing, and, and it was really very minor. Uh, but in that letter, uh, I included a notice of intent to be civilly disobedient on May 15th that might involve my incarceration. Yes, I literally threatened to make them arrest me. Um, and uh, I included a five-page memorandum of law. And I sent that to one person. I didn't tell anybody else. Mm -hmm. a and I got two calls from that person. Jim, how serious are you? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I said, well, uh, I'm finishing, uh, I I'm completing a uh, petition for an extraordinary writ of habeas corpus and certiorari to the Supreme Court of the United States, compliant to Rule 33.1, uh, which is a, a rule that makes it almost impossible uh, for any pro se litigant to uh, uh, to file with them because it, it's a requirement, special paper, special binding, all of that. Um, and it was basically a plea for uh, an arraignment. And the way I had explained it, it was like, oh no, he's not backing down. <laughs> uh, the result was that uh, instead of me backing down, uh, a man who used to be the Attorney General of the state of New York, who used to sit on a presidential cabinet and now st sits in the governor's chair, yes, that's right, Governor Andrew Cuomo, uh, on May 14th, ended up signing Executive Order 202.31, suspending that particular penal code because my, uh, my intended civil disobedience was May 15th. So, yeah, uh, the governor ended up standing down on that one. Uh, they're, they're not likely to, uh, to give me a hard time. And I do respect the guys. They, they got to do their job. And it's not an easy job, especially with me. Because I don't give them any purchase. I am literally a, uh, a walking, breathing federal lawsuit looking for a place to happen. And I'll find it. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I think that one of the things that always impresses me about visiting James's apartment is uh, it's more like a legal library than anything. So it's, I would say it's about 80% legal uh, legal library and 10% living space. <laughs> yeah. 10% other. It's you not know. big. Yeah, yeah, it's a tidying place. But that's the thing. They don't, you know, they don't anticipate somebody going to the lengths that you have to do the research and to, uh, you know, to, to become informed. And one of the things I want to go back to a basic argument is like, okay, we're talking about cameras in court. Um, and court watching and one of the big ones is uh, you know why isn't this already in place you know or why now they're making it so hard for for people to even just enter the building and be watchers why not or even better why are there no trials in family court how come we don't have jurors <laughs> all right you just asked the question yeah you know th there was a place I used to work and, and they said don't ask James a question to, to the new people. <laughs> and it, it was one of those things where, why? He knows the answers. He'll answer you. <laughs> He'll Jim it. Yeah. So we're, we're going to go back to before uh, August 1st of 1640. <laughs> that's, that's before we were born. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We we're not quite that old. <laughs> but what we had was the court of the Star Chamber. Okay. And the court of the Star Chamber was a court in England that was meant to be an efficient court system where uh, privy counselors would go in before, uh, before a representative of the crown and, and plead on behalf of both sides. And the court would produce an order and, and the, the defendants were, would find out what came of that. There was no due process in there. They didn't have the right to argue. If they went and they had to speak, they had to take an ex officio oath, meaning they had to testify against themselves. Okay. Now, there was a gentleman by the name of John Lilburn that said, oh, no, not doing that. And, of course, he got arrested. And he made a big enough stink that on August 1st of 1640, the Habeas Corpus Act was, uh, was put in place where anybody could be taken out of jail and given a trial before a new court and the court of the Star Chamber was disbanded. And 
trial by jury was was something that uh, was certainly uh, brought about in the Middle Ages. Now, to fast forward a little bit, you had a situation where uh, there was still that power and control being exercised in the colonies. And if Parliament uh, didn't like something you wrote, and I'm going to give an example. One of the first printing presses was uh, brought over by uh, James Franklin, Ben's older brother. Uh, and he wrote something that uh, that the legislature didn't like, so they put him in jail for contempt. Mm -hmm. It kind of set Ben the wrong way. And years later, 1735, there was another uh, printer uh, by the name of uh, Zenger, uh, that, uh, Peter Zenger, I believe, that... Uh, wrote something about the governor that the governor didn't like. And the governor tried twice to, to have a grand jury uh, find cause of action against them. Ended up having to do it by way of information and tried him in front of a jury because it was criminal. And the jury found him not guilty. That is foundational for why we have freedom of the press in the First Amendment. And uh, that was that was a really significant case. Now, um, with respect to juries, uh, we should have, pursuant to Federalist Essay Number 83, juries in civil litigation. And there was certainly a move for that at the time. To be honest, I don't remember why it was, it was not allowed to go forward, but it wasn't. And there has always been the urge to clamp down on uh, information. To, to keep limited, especially for those that are in positions where their, uh, their power and authority um, might be challenged because of any misconduct that they mm -hmm. might have done. So in New York State, we have uh, 22 NYCRR, <coughs> that is New York uh, Codes, Rules, and Regulations, uh, promulgated by the Chief Judge of the State of New York, um, Par, uh, let's see, section 29 and section 131 relating to this. Those are not ratified statutes. We have two statutes that do apply. One is New York State Judicial Law Section 4 that says, but for eight specific instances, we have the right to freely sit in court as public. We can walk into any court and sit down unless there are those eight. And those eight are, are tailored towards um, protecting special wow. victims. There is also New York State Civil Rights uh, Law Section 52 uh, that would, uh, would go towards protecting any, uh, anybody subpoenaed uh, from, from having their testimony chilled by being on camera. So that's a legitimate and ratified use within the legislature. I accept that. Of course, juries, the same would apply. Now, with, with respect to the other two, uh, Part 29 and Part 131, that was never ratified by we the people. That is repugnant to the Constitution. That is repugnant to freedom of the press within the First Amendment. And under Marbury v. Madison, 1803, I argue that that is void and without effect. And I intend to fully challenge that. I'm doing that across several cases. Uh, one is the Thomas Valva case in family court. Now, there is the issue there where the judge, in his discretion, does have the capacity to invoke New York State Judicial Law Section 4. However, there is nothing, I believe, that is going to come up in the particular trial that is not already public knowledge. Uh, made public by, uh, by Justina, uh, Thomas's, uh, Thomas's mother. So, uh, I filed an amicus curiae brief into that case. Now, in my own case, uh, which is coming up on Wednesday, mm -hmm. uh, I have filed a motion, including the application for, for uh, having cameras uh, in court and live streaming, uh, with the judge. And he was supposed to have responded by now. He hasn't responded to any of the motions. Mm -hmm. But John J. Leo is corrupt. He has shed his jurisdiction time and time again. And this is one of the reasons why. I'll give you an example, a um, couple of examples that, that are personal to me. Carol McKenzie was a sitting, a sitting state Supreme Court judge. And uh, I decided January 25th, a couple of years ago, that I was going to challenge her jurisdiction. And I had written out a short sheet of paper. And every time I looked down, 
she mouthed over the head of the court reporter to the opposing counsel, stop him. There weren't any cameras in court. The court reporter couldn't catch that. It wasn't spoken. But I had two court watchers there that did catch it, That's put big. it in an affidavit, and forced her recusal. It may have helped force her off the bench. She was uh, she was in retirement at wow. that point, but it may have helped force her off the bench. So um, that was that was one instance. Now John J. Leo loses his mind regularly and just explodes at people. That is not judicial temperament. That is meant to intimidate the defendant. And that is not due process well, of law. He's been getting away for years with it, so why stop now? And he is absolutely petrified that he might lose and, and slip back into that. And to do it on camera, oh, wait, he did that. I was arrested earlier this year in his courtroom. Yeah. And, and that was caught. And, and that made it up as high as the Office of Court Administration. And, well, I've come across their desk a few times since then. Uh, I've, I've forced the issue with the governor that... that ended up going through them uh i kicked open the uh, the virtual courts because the courts as a function of covid have been closed physically and everybody said no you can't be in the courts um but uh, they closed it they created these virtual courts where they said oh the public can't be part of it you can't have anybody watching you can't record really that is intimidation that most people don't know the law and most people will buy into. Yeah. And I've actually researched it. So when I go and I do well, something... these actual laws or their policies? That is a rule. All right? It is a rule of the chief judge. And it is coded uh, as 22 NYC RR 29 point uh, whatever, 1A. And uh, it is... Uh, affected by part 29 as well excuse me part 131 so you've got this situation where this hasn't been ratified by the legislature mm -hmm. they're just using all oh, the court has the authority to regulate itself okay fine not when you infringe upon my clearly established rights so when i go and i do this sort of thing i don't do this lightly i don't do this you know oh gee it's spur of the moment mm -hmm. I put myself in a situation where I have a habeas corpus written that has three pages worth of authorities. It's 87 pages long. And it's meant to go before an Article Three judge in the Eastern District of New York. Okay. So... Which is a big point, big difference between just being defiant and standing your ground and actually having ground to stand on. Right. Two very different things. I, You know, I, I've literally said... To the top court officer, you're going to arrest me on December 23rd. Mm -hmm. That's one thing, too. James, maybe we could tell a little bit about that. We'll get non sequitur, but, well, actually, it is. Uh, I do want to talk about your case because uh, I was mentioning before that, you know, I'm, we have the show at 9 o'clock in the morning, and I'm trying to give a consistent platform for people to speak out. But it's very, very important for James to have court watches. So on Wednesday, uh, I'm, I'll do the show a different time, but... Uh, James is going back against the judge. How many times have you sued Leo? Oh, uh, let's see. I sued him in federal court along with four other sitting, st well, sitting or previous state court judges, uh, two, uh, um, two police and uh, a retired uh, town clerk. Um, oh, and the attorney general uh, of the state of New York. Um, I've sued him in two Article 78 proceedings. And I've just recently sued him again in state Supreme Court. So we're looking at four times? Yeah, we're at four. I, I'm behind <laughs> on my paperwork. Well, need, needless <laughs> to say, this isn't going to go well on Wednesday. It's not going to go well at all. So, Yeah. Uh, a judge can expect protection uh, from, from uh, prosecution unless there is a clear absence of all jurisdiction. Now, what this particular judge, and I use that term loosely, uh, did was he adjudicated and wrote an order in a complete absence of all jurisdiction and he did it with me oops okay. <laughs> <laughs> so now he needs an attorney again uh my ex 
needs an attorney. My ex's attorney needs an attorney. Uh, <laughs> the, the attorneys need attorneys at this point. And round and round it goes. I've already had one judge recuse in that case, and I've just filed it last month. So I, I, maybe there will be more. Who knows? Okay. It, it, it should get interesting. But that's that's a side case. But if we're looking for court watches, we're looking at Wednesday, December 23rd at 9 a.m. You're right. And civil or Supreme Court? That is, uh, well, it well, is family, a civil case in, in Supreme Court. It is a situation where one of the things he could do is he could adjourn. So I want everybody to check Web Civil the morning of just to see if it's still scheduled. Mm. Because what he's going to do, who knows? Have I made my uh, my intent known? I've done everything but, you know, write it in the sky. Okay. <laughs> That'll but, be next. Yeah. And this is a judge who who refused to call a jury for me back uh, last uh, last year or, or whenever it was that I had the trial, and I called my own jury on the radio. Yes. So it, it was, it, you know, I'm going to push him to the limit. Mm -hmm. And if if he wants to arrest me, well, now he's got to deal with the fact that that's not a lawful mandate. Uh, that he has no power pursuant to New York State Judicial Law Section 750, I believe it's sub 6, where what I'm doing by live streaming is producing an accurate record of the proceedings within the court. Mm -hmm. What was that stat you told me with court reporters? They only had to be about 80% accurate or something along those lines? No, the, the testing requirement for court reporters is such that they need to pass the test once at a speed of 200 words per minute and be 95% 95 accurate. Big so now let's let's consider this. Oh gee, well 95 is pretty good, right? Mm -hmm. If I put you on a plane to Hawaii non-stop with 95% of the fuel needed to get there, how would you feel about that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> worry a little bit. <laughs> okay. And when it's something that that could be a life or death situation like what goes on in some of these courts, certainly it was with with Thomas Valva. Um, you would want an accurate transcript mm -hmm. from which to appeal. And in order for you to validate that it's an accurate transcript, you would want to have some sort of recording to compare it against. Yeah. But to be prohibited that recording to compare it against is a deprivation of your fundamental due process as a defendant. Yeah. And to have... Uh, to have prior restraint against somebody being in the courtroom and being able to witness, e either physically or virtually, any judicial misconduct, such that an affidavit can be uh, can be written. Well, before we go to that, James, I want to ask everybody just for a moment, because there are some people that make this uh, show possible. I'd like to thank Guy Radio USA for giving us a platform to talk on, but also our good friend Gary Jacobs from Americans for Legal Reform and Long Island Backstory. Uh, who helps make this show possible. So we're just going to take a brief uh, commercial break, and we're going to come back. And also, non sequitur, but I do want to mention one of the comments in here that I found really, uh, really important. So we're going to do a little commercial, and I'm just going to read one more comment and get back to James. You know, in life, we all make mistakes. And some mistakes are very expensive, and they're hard to fix, like a bad marriage. But our pets make mistakes, too. And sometimes our dogs are going to pee or poop on the floor. And the best and most economical way to fix that is with Scoochie Pets Whiz Be Gone and Poop Be Gone. They're both all natural, and they're made in the USA with organic ingredients. They're enzyme-based products, and they really work. I got three big dogs, Casey, Forrest, and Rambo. I know firsthand what it's like, okay? I got it. I got it. Believe me, I know what it is, all right? So let me tell you, Scoochie Pets Whiz Be Gone and Poop Be Gone. They're available at specialty pet retailers all across the United States, Amazon, Walmart.com, Groupon, eBay, and many other fine online retailers. Scoochie Pets Whiz Be Gone and Poop Be Gone. Scoochie Pets Whiz Be Gone and Poop Be Gone. Scoochie Pets Whiz Be Gone and Poop Be Gone. It just doesn't get any better than this. Get it today. Well, that was, I should have toned that down and step it down, but I just shut it off. But I do want to read in the comments because um, 
There, there's quite a few of you that joined us this morning. I want to say thank you and good morning to you for being here with us. Uh, and there's some activists who have been saying hello that I've seen over the years and been very active in D.C. And, and within their own respective states. But I have a good friend of mine from Colorado who is a wonderful person that suffered a, a, a tremendous tragedy, the loss of her son. And I'm going to read a comment from uh, Lara Thompson, uh, two comments from her. And she states, I'm experiencing alienation even as our son lays in the car in his office last week at age 20. There was not one photo of me at our son's funeral on Friday, December 18th. I was left out of the planning meeting for his funeral. I have yet to have even a phone call from the police or the hospital, even though our son's heart and eyes were harvested after a tragic car accident in Boulder Can uh, County in Colorado, December 12th. Please remember his name is Connor Jacob William Thompson. I uh, was born in two 2000 and, and passed away in 2020. And Lara also has, if you look in the comments, a GoFundMe uh, in his honor. And, um, you know, James and I are both alienated parents, and uh, to deny a parent access to the child even at a funeral, I think that that's, to me, I, I just, uh, I couldn't, I think it takes a special type of evil <laughs> to alienate a, a child to begin with, but then even at something so tragic like that to not, uh, allow access to uh, a child I think is uh, unspeakable. So for those of you out there, please look into Lara Thomas, uh, L-A-R-A-H, last name is Thompson, sorry, not Thomas, Thompson. And um, very tragic story, Lara. Um, my heart goes out to you, James, as well. And um, if you're willing or able to tell your story, I would love to be able to tell your story. And whatever way I can help you, I will help you. So uh, Lara, best wishes to you, and I'm so sorry for your tragic loss. Uh, before before the break, though, James was going to break out one of his affidavits. And knowing James personally, this is a, a exceedingly light reading. I don't know if you can see James's, James's motions are usually on the order of 600 or more pages. So uh, I almost thought that that was just part of a glossary. But James, what do you got, what do you got going on there with that piece of paper? Uh, before before I even do that, I, I, I want to address something. And, and Lara, I am so genuinely sorry for your loss. And, and it breaks my heart. And to have to have parental alienation is is what's driven this fight in me. Uh, I've realized that parental alienation cannot happen without parental gatekeeping. Parental gatekeeping cannot happen without the abuse of the doctrine of parents betray by the courts, and the abuse of the doctrine of parents betray cannot happen without the violation of rights. And inherent in that is the loss of jurisdiction that the judges have. So it has led me down a path to study this at a depth that few others have across disciplines that few others have. And I, I do this in the hopes that parents can reconnect, that children can reconnect with their parents. And losses like this, losses like Thomas Valva, and, and there was another one uh, that, uh, uh, that I had seen recently where an 11-year-old was shot. Um, by a parent trying to keep the child from the other parent and killed um this is what drives me and uh well i'm going to step back uh into the 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 discussion with getting into court for us mm -hmm. as a lead into this because once i made the challenge to to the first uh first officer and he went back and he made a call and he said uh gee they're not buying the official line that I gave them. Um, and, and he wants, one of these guys wants to come up and speak before the judge and move the judge. Um, then he came back after that phone call and said, okay, come on in. Okay. And everybody was just magically allowed to come in. And we made it up to the court and we were told, well, you wouldn't be able to get into the courtroom. All right. Now, I happen to have a word with the... Uh, uh, the attorney for for the defendant, but I, I think it, at the point where I was told you're not going to be able to to get into the courtroom, I literally took out my keys and said, "Here, hold my keys," <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's an indication that I might just get arrested today. <laughs> yeah, it might happen. Uh, so I've done that several times, right? Yeah. <laughs> so. I, I did that, and I, I told the uh, the attorney that I intend to argue that I have the right to sit 
in the court pursuant to New York State Judicial Law Section 4 that the judge has a complete absence of all jurisdiction and discretion to deny me since none of the eight elements of New York State Judicial Law were present. Since nobody is being subpoenaed, New York State Judicial Law, excuse me, uh, Civil Rights Law Section 52 does not apply. And uh, I, I can either be granted access or I can be granted a cause of action where the defendant would derivatively have a, uh, a basis, a, a cause of action to challenge jurisdiction of the judge. Interestingly, you know, he, he went in, he spoke, said whatever he needed to speak with, and uh, the doors opened. And I was allowed in with the defendant and uh, found out later everybody else was in theory allowed in. But uh, they certainly were not going to deny me because I didn't give any room for that denial to happen. Now, this is one of my, and it's redacted, but this is a different case uh, arising out of New York's uh, New York State uh, Family Court in Nassau County. This was one of those situations where a link was given to call in. So you couldn't see what was happening. You couldn't see anybody mouthing uh, any kind of instructions or something like that or making any kind of faces. And uh, again, it does not, and the COVID emergency does not... Uh, suspend New York State Judicial Law Section 4, where we have the clearly established right as just regular citizens to sit in court. So, um, yeah, I, I've done motions as large as 729 pages, two volumes. And, and this is only five pages, three of which are, are form. The actual affidavit has several points, um, and, and I'm going to go through it relatively quickly. Uh, my notification as to how I found out about it, the access phone numbers and the codes I, I included, what time I called, uh, how long I was on hold, um, that I was not let in, that all I heard was hold music. Uh, and, and then I continued on. You see, what the judges are afraid of is that somebody actually understands this information and knows how to use it. So I, I continued on, point 10, uh, New York State Judicial Law Section 4 clearly, established my, uh, clearly establishes my right to freely sit in court. My right to access the court and my right to freely sit in court was denied under color of the law and without due process of law. This is a federal violation of 18 U.S.C. Sections uh, 242 and 241. Uh, because it's it's a judge, you can't sue them under that, but you do have a cause of action to sue them uh, in in federal court uh, pursuant to 42 U.S.C. sections 1983 and 1985, and I've done that with other judges. Um, so, in addition to that, the court exercised unbridled prior restraint uh, upon my constitutionally protected First Amendment right, prohibiting my right to observe the proceeding and offer an affidavit regarding the validity of the transcript supplied of the court reporter and to report any visual judicial misconduct. Well, that's a major no-no. And here's why. And, and this is one I've got to read point for point, but it's relatively short. The knowing, willing, and intentional deprivation of my rights as a member of public by the court cannot be done by a judge in his or her official capacity pursuant to their oath of office required by Article 13 of the Constitution of the State of New York uh, because of the good behavior clause in the Constitution of the United States as supported by the stare decis of Ex Parte Young 1908 Supreme Court decision, and I'm going to quote from within a uh, within a Second Circuit case. Uh, that Second Circuit case is Curtin K I R T O N v Hassel, number 96, uh, C V 1371 S J, uh, 1998, uh, W L 146701 Eastern District of New York. Uh, March 25th, 1998, and it reads, 
Ex parte Young explains that when a state officer acts under a state law in a manner violative of the federal constitution, he comes into conflict with the superior authority of that constitution, and he is in that case stripped of his official or representative character and is subjected in his person to the consequences of his individual conduct. The state has no power to impart to him any immunity from responsibility from the responsibility to the supreme authority of the United States. So that, in a nutshell, destroys the, the qualified immunity that surrounds this situation. And with respect to the executive branch, uh, that's followed up with Shure v. Rhodes 1974 Supreme Court decision, Woods v. Strickland 1975, uh, Harlow v. Fitzgerald, 1982, and uh, uh, let's see, there's just one recently, uh, I believe it's Tanzin v. Tenier, uh, 2020 U.S. Supreme Court decision. So we've got a situation where the judges have a requirement under another rule uh, to maintain competence in their subject matter jurisdiction. That is 22 NYC 100.3 B sub 1. And uh, there's no mechanism for them to get back their jurisdiction once they shed that jurisdiction. So when a judge strips themselves of their judicial character and of, of their uh, subject matter jurisdiction, they cannot write any valid order. Everything in that court is void, fraud upon the court and without effect. And that's essentially what I go on to, uh, uh, to say in this. And I liken it to a de novo court of the Star Chamber proceedings that occurred behind closed doors. Uh, and, you know, with that lack of jurisdiction, the whole thing's void. So, the last thing a judge wants to do is hear me argue that point and completely undo everything that they tried to do. I've realized that when I go into court, uh, it, it's not about getting, a, getting an equitable solution to a problem. It is about having rights deprived and people making money. So one of the things that I've done in, in some of the filings that I've done is I've, I've included a notice of an offer to contract. And along with that notice of an offer to contract is my fee schedule. So I have a very, very high fee schedule. Um, you want to violate my rights, it's $10,000, payable only in U.S. constitutional coinage, uh, silver and gold coinage at face value. That's it. And uh, I, I've got a memorandum of law that runs a couple pages on that point. James alone. and I have talked about this constitutional coin because I didn't even know it existed. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it's almost like I want to be paid in I don't know peanuts or something. Not, well, not peanuts, but I mean it's so unique that I was like, how did you even find out about constitutional coinage? Is what I want to know. You know, it's it's kind of what I do. I I read the Constitution, and the Constitution says that you know the the only currency is is put forward by the united states constitution in silver and gold coinage what we have now uh in terms of folding money is federal reserve notes that are essentially ious by the federal reserve they're not real um uh, constitutional coinage not real money it's i'm not going to accept uh that if i don't have to Gotcha. And what you, what a lot of people don't understand is that just because it's legal tender to pay all debts, if it is prior to incurring a debt, I have the right to establish what form of payment that I want that debt paid in, should that debt be incurred. <laughs> I love this. I just love it. And so that ends up being a very expensive proposition to, to violate my rights. And... Uh, so I've got my own case. I've got I've got a motion in that that the judge has ignored. Uh, I'm going to be filing later today another motion in uh, the village, uh, the the justice court of the village of Port Jefferson, New York, and th this is a case that uh, uh, that appealed to me because it, it involved one of my favorite Supreme Court cases, 
Shuttlesworth v. City of Birmingham, Alabama, 1969. And in that case, what happened was it was the middle of the civil rights era, and a, a, a gentleman decided that he was going to uh, he was going to have everybody walk down the street on the sidewalks and, and march to a particular location. I can't even remember the location. Mm -hmm. And he was charged with having a parade without a license. Now, in this particular case in Port Jefferson, a group called the Sutauka Patriots held a 9-11 uh, event because a lot of them personally knew people that died. And uh, they applied for a parade license. They did not get one. They walked down the sidewalks. They were issued a summons for, a, uh, for having a parade without a license. Now, I wasn't there. I haven't seen any of the evidence for or against. But this, this is a fundamental First Amendment issue. And quite honestly, th there's a personal component to this for me that deals with its location. You see, Port Jefferson is right next to the three villages. And the three villages are where my children are. Mm -hmm. And I want my children to recognize that, no, I'm not fighting their mother. I'm fighting the system that supports abusive behavior of parents. And I can't do that just in my own case. I need to be in other cases. And this is one that's in their backyard. Yeah. So in that respect, uh, the motion I'm filing goes and, and cites my standing as a member of the public to do what I'm doing, uh, the judge's jurisdiction, uh, a memorandum of law that is tight. And uh, it offers the judge four opportunities that the judge will not like. The first is to affirm my clearly established right. The second is to deny my right and explain across all 11 or so points in a finding of fact and conclusions of law as to why, on what basis, I'm being denied. That can't be done. Mm -hmm. uh, the third is to purchase my acquiescence by paying my fee. I don't think he's going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see the constitutional coin. I want to see what it looks like. And, uh, <laughs> and and then the fourth is to grant me a cause of action against all parties that, that come together to affect and, and impair my right mm -hmm. uh, in federal court. Now, the last time I was there, I had an equipment malfunction. It, it was the arraignment. I had an equipment malfunction. And so I... You were there. Yeah. Uh, I, so I put everything back in the car and I went in and I, I sat down and... Um, but there were deprivations of rights outside that courtroom that were just not appropriate. First of all, the building was physically locked. Second of all, there were two uh, people outside that required proof of identity before walking in. That is not freely accessing the courts. It was worse than that because they were, they were writing notes. I think they were writing our names. When we, oh, yeah. Well, there's a couple of things. One, it was freezing cold out. Yeah. <laughs> and two, so they had, had everyone standing outside. They were only going to allow in 10, right? Ten that's individuals it. outside of the litigants, and that's arbitrary and capricious. Yeah, and there, there were two, an elderly couple there that uh, you know it's particularly cold, and had them waiting outside. And they kept telling us over oh, ten minutes, fifteen minutes. It kept getting the wait time kept getting extended. But then when we got there, we had to, I had to, we had to produce our licenses, and they were taking uh, I don't know what information, our names, uh, and God only knows what else for, off of our licenses and putting putting on a list. So I was like, I, you know, I've never seen such a thing. And honestly, at that point, I should have just asked more questions, but I was more concerned with getting into the building. Unless there anything. is an articulable suspicion of that a crime has happened or is about to occur, they have absolutely no authority to require that. None. Mm -hmm. And that, that was something that I thought about arguing with, but I wanted to be very careful uh, and and to be able to argue that point in and of itself, yes, I could have, I would have won, uh, but the, the issue wasn't arguing that point. The, the issue was challenging the rule of not recording. Mm -hmm. That's what I wanted to do. And because I had technical issues, I deferred on, uh, on challenging anything else. But, uh, you know, to, to actually have my, my phone searched to make sure that it was off, that's a Fourth Amendment violation right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
and, and the arbitrary and capricious number of of 10 has no basis in in fact as to oh gee this is going to protect the substantial interest of the state mm -hmm. especially when i am a covid recovered individual that can neither contract nor uh nor well uh, here i'm telling it. you <laughs> well, there's people out there who were not as familiar so right so uh, I, I'll, i'm going to touch on a very brief uh topic with respect to covid and and the masks the the mask law the executive uh, order 202.17 uh, there is a secondary uh, issue with that where under 42 usc section 12102 sub 1 and sub 3 the definition of a disability um i actually meet that definition because i am perceived for over six months as being an asymptomatic carrier when i in fact have recovered have the antibodies and cannot spread it so strangely that qualifies under the definition as being disabled. So I'm now a protected class. The wearing of the mask is a First Amendment right. That triggers at least intermediate scrutiny. Intermediate scrutiny requires that the state's substantial interest of reducing the spread of COVID be narrowly tailored to its infringement upon rights. Mm -hmm. And it's not because I can't spread it. So it is unconstitutional at that level as well. I've just decided that instead of arguing that point, what I wanted to do instead was to argue that I have the Ninth and Tenth Amendment right as an individual with a camera, a smartphone, and a social media platform to turn around and live stream uh, the proceedings in court uh, pursuant to the, uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act because it, the federal government certainly cannot do that at the state level. So the state, uh, the state is uh, not choosing not to exercise that power. Therefore, it falls to me, and I can do it. Gives me a little bit of an extra edge in the federal court as well. <laughs> so I know our time's getting close. No, no, we have time. We have time. I was just trying to figure out where that noise is coming from, that background noise. But, uh, you know, these are, all, these are all big things. And, again, I want to give a little bit of attention to what's going on with you on Wednesday because uh, that is a big day. And I think that, you know, the holidays are coming around. But if anybody could actually be there to court watch for Jim, Jim has been nice enough to court watch for a lot of other people in the system with their court-related matters. And I think that on Wednesday morning, uh, if anybody would be able to, uh, to join me in supporting Jim as a court watcher, you know, that would be important. And uh, here's another thing, uh, just for those those of us who've been on the inside, I didn't know this, but Jim knows it now, thanks to me giving him a heads up, that when you're going to court and there's a risk of incarceration, uh, then you bring extra clothes. So you wear extra t-shirts, extra underwear, and extra socks because you're going to need those for once you're incarcerated. So Jim, do you plan on dressing accordingly for your, uh, <laughs> for your appearance? Two pairs of white socks, uh -huh. uh, short and long underwear, mm -hmm. uh, undershirts, uh, thermal undershirt, yeah. Yeah, so we're going to have a good <laughs> so, And uh, Jim's going to have to figure out something for commissary because Jim's commissary is going to get confiscated also, which is, I'll teach you how to work around that. You uh, basically have to find an inmate that you trust the most out of all the people <laughs> you can't trust and put money on his commissary so that you can get to him. Carlos, but, I don't intend on being there very long. Uh, yeah, I, I, I intend on borrowing a pen. That's, yeah, that's it. I want to sign my habeas corpus. I want to hand it off uh, and, and get it mailed out. And then as soon as the federal courts are open and can hear it, then they take me over and they look at it and they say, excuse me? <laughs> uh, yeah, so it's going to be a big morning. We've got a lot going on that day. But again, Come to my Christmas party. Yeah, it's going to be uh, Wednesday, 9 a.m. at, um, uh, my God, Central Islip Supreme Court Judge Leo. So anybody, 400 Carlton Avenue, room D65. Yeah, so I think we're going to need, you know, need a little bit of support and help. But I, I do want to thank everybody for uh, joining us this morning. Um, it's nice to see so many faces show up on the comments and, and the viewing. So thank I want to say thank you. If anybody out there would like to, uh, uh, one of the things I found about being a victim and first having to be, her first having the opportunity to tell my story is that it was an empowerment and a relief. I felt that it was something I could do about it, bring attention to what was going on. So, you know, one of the things I'm, I'm looking to achieve here is to give people the opportunity to tell this story, to bring attention to what's going on in their case and the injustices that take place 
daily in family court, if not minute to minute. So if you're interested, please let me know. I'll be happy to bring you on the show and we can discuss what you've experienced. Um, and I, again, I want to say thank you to iRadio USA. I'd like to say thank you to Gary Jacobs and the Americans for Legal Reform for making this show possible. And I'm going to see if I can get that commercial to play. So give me a second. Thank you for having me, Carlos. My pleasure. And I can't. And Eric's not here, so I don't know how to do it. Well, let me try one more time. Here. Bring it up to there. And let's see. Hey. You know, in life, we all make mistakes. And some mistakes are very expensive and they're hard to fix, like a bad marriage. But our pets make mistakes, too. And sometimes our dogs are going to pee or poop on the floor. And the best and most economical way to fix that is with Scoochie Pets Whiz Be Gone and Poop Be Gone. They're both all natural and they're made in the USA with organic ingredients. They're enzyme-based products and they really work. I got three big dogs, Casey, Forrest, and Rambo. I know firsthand what it's like, okay? I got it. I got it. Believe me, I know what it is, all right? So let me tell you, Scoochie Pets Whiz Be Gone and Poop Be Gone. They're available at specialty pet retailers all across the United States, Amazon, Walmart.com, Groupon, eBay, and many other fine online retailers. Scoochie Pets Whiz Be Gone and Poop Be Gone. Scoochie Pets Whiz Be Gone and Poop Be Gone. Scoochie Pets Whiz Be Gone and Poop Be Gone. It just doesn't get any better than this. Get it today. Well, here we are, and I want to say thank you to Scoochie Pet Products for uh, making this possible today. And again, I want to stress if anybody's available on Wednesday morning at 9 o'clock in Central Islip to please be there for Jim. Uh, we could use the support. And this can actually lead to a change in courts where we can have um, cameras in court or in a minimum have people back in the courts to watch the proceedings that are going on. So until I see you again tomorrow, wish you well, stay healthy, and take care, and have a good day. You too.